Friends, can I say how lovely it is to be here from London and to say a very big thank you to all of you for your welcome and particularly to the clergy here for the invitation and the opportunity to be here this Sunday morning. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. Let us pray. Holy God, break thy word among us as bread for the feeding of our famished souls. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Friends, I want to preach this morning on those words that we heard from St. Paul in our reading from Romans, for you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. Now, before I say any more, I have a confession to make to you, lovely saints of St. Bart's, and it's this. I have a love-hate relationship with dear St. Paul. <laughs> By that I mean I'm not always sure whether St. Paul is for me or against me, whether he would actually be someone that I could chill with or whether his presence would just really irritate me. Sometimes I wonder if he is one of those people who on paper might come across as really good fun um, but, or even just occasionally fine, but who in person would be slightly difficult and tiring to be around. You know the type. And of course, as a priest who happens to be both black and gay, whose academic interests focus on the body and desire, and whose vocation was nurtured almost wholly by ordained women, you might have some idea why St. Paul and I have this fragile, sometimes tense, relationship, where I so often find him hard to love and his words difficult to swallow. But just when I feel like I'm about to give up on him, I remember that he is also the person who says some of the most profoundly beautiful and theologically rich things in the entirety of the New Testament. Who cannot love those words from 1 Corinthians 13 about love? Love is patient, love is kind, you know the one that I'm thinking about. All those powerful words from Galatians Three, where Paul speaks of there being no longer Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. Or think of Paul's words in Romans 5, where he says that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us. And lastly, think of that wonderful way he flips our ideas of power and strength by speaking about that power which is made perfect in weakness. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, he's not all bad. He's not all bad. And on those days when I struggle to love him for what he says, then I cast my mind upon the utter unlikelihood of this guy's story. That vengeful Roman soldier going around killing Christians the most unlikely candidate for an apostle ever. <laughs> Let's be honest, you wouldn't longlist him, let alone shortlist him for any position in the church of God. And yet there he is. In his delusion and his violence, Saul, as he was then, encounters on that blessed road to Damascus one who knew him better than he knew himself. Flashes of light like thunder come down before him and a voice Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? To which he says, who are you, Lord? And then thrown off his horse and blinded for a not insignificant three days, his heart was open to behold love at its source, a love which turned his life upside down and inside out and sent him on another road now in the service no longer of the empire, but of the kingdom of God. Swords into plowshares, spears 
into pruning hooks, the lion and the lamb laying down together and the little child leading them. Now that Paul, that unlikely servant of God, I love. I'm down for that Paul. He's interesting. He's real. Because it is that Paul that makes everything the later Paul writes and says credible. I think, friends, that what St. Paul is speaking about in Romans today is something he came to know deep within himself. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. Paul is speaking of what happens when you and I find intimacy with the one true and living God. When we are thrown off our horses, have the eyes of our hearts opened, find ourselves on a new road, when we have taken off the uniform of battle against God and been clothed in Christ. You see, it's easy to miss because you can get caught up in all the flesh stuff that Paul says in our reading today and all of the flesh stuff in Romans. But you have an option. You can also get up in everything he says about birth pains and hope. But right there in the middle, almost hidden in plain sight, is a golden nugget that we ignore at our peril. That thing about adoption. Paul is telling us that you and I are not who or what we think we are. We're not our failures. We're not our sins. We're not our past or our present. We're not broken. We're not abandoned. We're not condemned. We are, as he said, children of God, and if children, heirs, and joint heirs with Christ. It's huge. In my work in our parish in London as a confessor, I often have people who come to me and are completely weighed down and burdened by guilt. And one of the things my own confessor said to me, which is very useful, is that when people come to confession, you don't need to tell them that they've messed up, otherwise they wouldn't be there. <laughs> right? They know. <laughs> Your job is to remind them of who and what they are, a beloved child of God. You're there to convince them as a priest that God isn't going to change God's mind about them, but they can and need to change their mind about God and about themselves. Your primary identity is beloved child of God. The end to the war of everyone against everyone begins with the end of the war of everyone against themselves and God. So often in his epistles, St. Paul tells us to give to others what we ourselves have found and received and come to know in Christ. In Colossians 3.13, he says, Forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also should forgive. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. St. Paul goes from not knowing who he was talking to on the road to Damascus, to seeing himself as an heir of God who encourages others to see and know themselves as heirs of God too. And surely it was that that gave him his courage to take the good news to places he could never have imagined. Surely it was that knowledge of who he was that gave him the courage to admit that his old life was wrong, unfulfilled, not really the real thing for him, Surely it was that discovery that gave him the strength to name to the world that he had encountered this thing, this person who completely transformed the shape and purpose of his life. One of my favorite videos on YouTube is of a young Nina Simone being interviewed, probably in her living room. And she sat on the floor with this interviewer who keeps on asking her one particular question. He says to her, Nina, 
what does freedom mean to you? And she replies with a cheeky smile, same thing it is to you, you tell me. And the interviewer presses her and says, no, no, really, come on, what, what is freedom to you? And Nina starts to laugh, and then taking a long, hard pause, she ponders in her heart the question, and eventually looks him dead in the eye and says, it's just a feeling, like love. How on earth can you ever tell someone who has never been in love what it's like to be in love, she says. You can describe things and you know it, but you cannot tell them what it means to be in love. Then struggling to find more words, it suddenly comes to her. I'll tell you what freedom means to me, she says. No fear. I mean, really, no fear. If I could have that half of my life, she says, just, just no fear. Friends, we live in a world racked by fear. Most of us, if we're honest, are overwhelmed by the anxiety that we feel about the future of the church, the future of our planet. Rightly, we're anxious about Russia and Ukraine. In our parish in the city of London and Tower Hamlets, the poorest borough in the UK, many are fearful about how they will pay their bills and whether or not their children will come home safe and alive at the end of a school day. And economic uncertainty messes too with our sense of identity, our sense of belonging, our sense of stability. There is a kind of fear that is just part of what it means to be human. But there's another kind of fear. The fear that comes from not knowing who we are or whose we are. One of the major themes in today's epistle is that of identity. Paul uses that powerful metaphor of adoption and he reminds the Christians of Rome and therefore he reminds us today, you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. We are children of God. And if children then heirs, joint heirs with Christ. Just process that for a moment. Not only are you a child of God, but you are an heir of God and a joint heir of God with Christ. What a powerful thing. Our inheritance is secure. And therefore, our old lives, marked by fear, need no longer hold us down. The spirit of adoption means that we are all sons, daughters, children of God, able to cry out, Abba, Father, and be heard <laughs> to the one who loved us from before the foundation of the world. Do not neglect your inheritance. <laughs> Remember who and what you are. Remember whose you are. The most powerful thing the church can give the world today, I'm convinced, is not membership of the Church of England or the Episcopal Church. It is relationship with a God who is alive and living, who says, you are mine forever. Loved, precious, valued. And I am not going to let you go, no matter what you do or who you are. There's nothing you can do that will make me love you any more or any less. As our friends in the Orthodox Church say in their funeral liturgy, I am an image of your ineffable glory, even though I bear the scars of my sin. I am an image of your ineffable glory, even though I bear the scars of my sin. So when you go home today, be bold. Look in that mirror, look yourself in the eye, and try and love what you see. 
And when you notice that gray hair or realize that your glasses prescription has changed for the worse, know that you are still always and forever a beloved child of God. And when you cannot let go of that past mistake that suddenly rises up again in your memory and tries to tell you that there is no good in you, remember your baptism. You belong to Christ. And nothing in all creation can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And if your heart is broken and the love you once had and thought would last forever has been lost, remember that nothing good is lost in God's economy. You belong to God. And you always belonged to God. And you will always belong to God. You are an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. And I know it sounds too good to be true, but it is true. All that the Father has is yours. God has opened heaven and poured out his richest treasures upon you. God in Christ has chosen you. And Christ has fashioned his family of people from every class and race and gender and sexuality and nation. And that is our good news. We are children of God. The steadfast love of the Lord for you will never cease, never despair of the mercy of God, never doubt that God is for you and with you, never doubt that despite what the world may say and despite how we may feel, you and I are loved with an everlasting love, a love which we will one day, I promise you, See face to face. And it will be like knowing and meeting love for the very first time. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.